Hi, Rizwana. Thank you so much for joining us today on IPS News. It's truly wonderful to have you and many congratulations on your awards. And I'm going to be talking about that uh, shortly, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm just going to quickly do a, you know, very brief introduction so that our audience and our viewers know a little more about you, and then we will get into our quick conversation. So joining us today, we have Rizwana Hassan. She's a lawyer who works to protect the environment in de and defend the dignity and rights of marginalized Bangladeshis. Through landmark legal cases over the past 20 years, Rizwana has changed the dynamic of development in Bangladesh to include a people-centric focus on environmental justice. In her capacity as chief executive of the public interest law firm, Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, she has argued and won monumental cases against deforestation, pollution, unregulated shipbreaking, and illegal land development. In 2009, Rizwana was named as one of 40 environmental heroes of the world by Time magazine and was awarded the Ramon Maxese Award in 2012 for her activism. Thank you so much for joining us here at IPS News for this conversation and congratulations on being awarded um, the International Women of Courage Awards by US Department of State. You are amongst one of the 12 extraordinary women from around the world to have been selected for this award. So tell us a little about the award ceremony that took place yesterday on the 14th of March and how do you feel about it? Uh, it's a very different kind of a feeling. Uh, initially, it gave me a very positive feeling. And, uh, you know, with every award, it's actually a recognition of your efforts. It's not really a person who is being awarded. It's also the process, the cause for which you fight. So I took it in that spirit. But then when I saw the other names being pronounced, the people who were pronouncing it, I thought, oh, my God, my work has crossed all these continents and reached up to the U.S. It's, it's, not, it's not a recognition that's coming from your family that is equally important or even more important, but coming it from a country like USA, which is God knows how many continents apart from where you live, is something truly very assuring and very empowering. So many congratulations again. I want to talk a little about growing up in Bangladesh. Do you see changes in the attitude towards women in professional positions? And do you see a marked change in progress for women, especially those in rural areas? I would answer your question with both a yes and a no. Uh, we are having women in Bangladesh in leading positions in many professional positions. It's not that we are only getting professional jobs. We are actually getting lead positions in, in many uh, professions. Um, we are taking up challenges. We are reaching heights that are unknown to uh, many of our male counterparts. Uh, with women getting empowered, this has posed definite threat to the patriarchy. And we operate in a very conservative society. We do have some inbuilt challenges in the society. There are many women who are quitting their job because they don't have really the support system to continue when it comes to a choice between taking care of your children and continuing with your job. So we don't really have the child care system in many, in, in most offices in Bangladesh, but that's a softer challenge. We have this very inherent inbuilt challenge of patriarchy. So when we, women become very independent, they start speaking out their mind. That is a definite blow to patriarchy and the only societal prescription against that is to uh, send the woman back to home and uh, shut their independent mind and seize their economic power. So yes, we are in professional positions, but then we are dealing with all the challenges that are there. I mean, it's not that a very uh, smooth path has been paved for us and we are just taking the journey through it. We have our own challenges to deal with. About the rural women, it's uh, more difficult because there is disparity between urban women and rural women in terms of uh, education, in terms of capacity, in terms of training, in terms of access to system. But then again, there are women in Bangladesh who are working in uh, the export-oriented garment sector. They are traveling 100 miles 
to come to Dhaka and to take up the job. They're not professional jobs, but they're that's the starting point for them. Mm -hmm. There are women in Bangladesh who are leaving Bangladesh, traveling thousand kilometers to uh, enter the labor market in the Middle Eastern countries. And those are starting point for them. There are a few women in rural areas who are taking up the challenges, trying to rise up to the occasion, trying to find an access for them in the mainstream service. But the violence, the exploitation they face in those markets are actually working as drawbacks for them to enter the mainstream uh, market force. Yeah. And at a time when women's issues and rights in Bangladesh are in the news for various reasons, tell us a little about your own journey into becoming a lawyer and an environmentalist. How easy or challenging was it to pursue your passion? And how would you compare your initial days of working on sensitive issues to the current present days right now? See, I work to promote the notion of environmental justice, as I described it theoretically. So when I started working in this area, it was all very rosy, you know, a new agenda. It's a very fashionable agenda. But then when I started going deep into the crisis, I realized that it's actually a very hard hitting agenda. It's a heavily political agenda. You have to stand against very organized economic powers. So initially it was easy. And I continued in this uh, particular arena because I probably did not realize the consequences of it. But so initially in one or two cases, people would take you very lightly as if it's a very romantic agenda. But then when you started talking against the real estate development because they were filling up your wetlands, when you started talking against the shipwreckers because they were importing the toxic level vessels and were dumping literally the Western vessels on your beaches, things started getting difficult for me. So yes, the, the Time magazine may call me a hero, but I am not favorites to the real realtors, to the shipwreckers, to the shrimp cultivators, to the polluters and the plunderers. Uh, it's on a personal note, it, it's, it's fulfilling and it's satisfying because this is the best thing that I can do for my children. I may practice other branches of law. I can earn huge amount of money, but end of the day, my children will be inhaling um, polluted air. We'll be drinking water that's not potable. We'll be having unsafe food. So against all those challenges, as a mother, I'm standing for an agenda, which I think is best for the interests of my own children. Yeah. And who are, in your view, the many women pioneers in different fields in Bangladesh? Who inspired you? I tell you something. This is a very politically incorrect question because I don't <laughs> want to be naming a few Basket uh, by others, but I, I would name um, two uh, Begum Rokia Sakot, who actually started with um, women's education, and then we have a uh, poet Begum Sufia Kamal. She uh, both of them actually embrace different aspects of women's uh, liberation and their freedom. And then I do have minds like I, I do have names like. Um, Kushi Kabir, Sultana Kamal, Aisha Khatun, Rubana Hawk, the Bangladeshi girl who uh, went to the top of Everest. Uh, they are all encouraging from their uh, own contribution to the society. Yeah. And I apologize to others whom I have not named. I'm sure there are other people who have equally, uh, who have played a, 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 a pivotal role in encouraging me, but just that at this moment, I can't remember their names. That's all right. <laughs> um, I'm coming back to your work. You work, you know, as you said, you work very closely on environment and climate change issues. So tell us a little about why you feel right now in 2020, the world needs to wake up to these issues and take action. Of course, there are reports that state it has been estimated that by 2050, one in every seven people in Bangladesh will be displaced by climate change. How urgent is it for everyone to start looking at this or have they failed to look at it in the past? We are still uh, passing through the pandemic. And during the pandemic, what we have learned is you must live with the nature. You can't win over nature. That is absolutely not possible. We are 
in an era of climatic change. And the threats of climate change are quite deadly. 52 small island countries, if I'm not mistaken, will go underwater if the temperature rise can't be controlled by 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of this century. And we are on a pathway of four degree increase. And if that happens, 52 island state nations will disappear. One third of my country will go under water. Uh, Mumbai will uh, disappear. Karachi will disappear. Our neighbor Maldives will just disappear. And it's like disappearance of civilization, disappearance of nationhood. And I will be forced to draw the map of Bangladesh differently. And during the pandemic, we have realized that even we have uh, crores and crores of dollars in our pockets, we won't be able to buy food if the food supply system is disrupted. If the water is contaminated, uh, you will not be able to buy the uh, very expensive French bottled water, even if you have enough dollars in your pocket. So money will not solve your problem. So the development paradigm has to shift. The way we are developing and the activities that are being termed as development processes are probably not correct. We have to rethink the model of development and do it, design them in a way that will be totally compatible with nature and natural beings. And that is, I, that is an area where I think we all have to concentrate, otherwise we'll actually be betraying with the future of our future generation. Yeah. Do you think we're doing enough to realize this seriousness, climate change and how it impacts our lives, particularly those from marginalized communities? Where do you think we are failing to identify or to help or provide the marginalized communities with adequate support, help, and even understanding of what climate change is? Our failure is deliberate and our failure is criminal. I say this because you see a country like US, which has a very good understanding of science and which has all the tech you know, technological command and financial uh, command in their hand. They also denied the reality of climate change until very recently when the presidency changed. Uh, and we are, and they're doing it, or the powerful economies are doing it, and they're continuing with their exploitative model of development because they are catering to the needs of few oligarchs, the fossil fuel companies and some other corporations. Huh? So uh, we are actually not being mindful uh, about our responsibility to the next generation. Uh, we now have alternatives in hand. So it's not that we are not only ignoring the challenges of climate change, we are at the same time denying the fact that we have safer alternatives, safer technologies. Uh, so I think we are uh, trying to defend the current exploitative development model only to serve the interests and they are nowhere in of this uh, mega development. And I think that is where uh, we are failing. There is inequity between urban and rural population, there is inequity between Western and Southern population. And we have to address these issues of any. Okay. And uh, since we're running out of time, my very last question to you. Moving forward, what do you hope to achieve through your work? And what would your message be for all aspiring lawyers and particularly women in Bangladesh and even around the world? For women in around the world, I would um, ask everyone to define their true interest, define their true interest, and define the true interest of their children. And for uh, young uh, lawyers, I would urge them to do at least one environmental case in their lifetime. And I can bet that that will be more rewarding, more satisfying than fighting 
hundreds and thousands of criminal civil and corporate cases. <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm going to say a very big thank you to you. Thank you so much for joining us today and for having this conversation. And many congratulations again on your recent award. Thank you, Rizwana. Thank you.